we made an early decision that we were not going to make this a concert film. Because, you know, our mantra in the editing room was that our film ends where most music films begin. And we did not, we didn't, you know, look, we had the luxury of not having to make a concert film because we had all this incredible activity and drama that was going on in these men's lives. So, you know, why do a concert film? I mean, any, you know, anybody could really go off and shoot 10 cameras and get a little bit of B-roll interview stuff behind the scenes. We had drama happening on an everyday basis. But admittedly, you know, there were times where we forgot how big these guys were. And because we were so used to being around a table like this in a kitchen or in the studio. And then when we went on the road with them to Europe and they're playing in front of 50, 60, 80, 100,000 people, you know, it's, it's, it's unbelievable power. And, you know, there's, the, there's a moment in the film where James takes the stage that Joe shot. Uh, on one side, you see him alone with a few technicians and, and Rob, the bass player. And it's his first time going back on stage, probably the first time he's ever been on stage sober in his 20, you know, 23 year career. And on one side of the frame, you basically see him just getting ready and thinking and being very, you know, internalizing what he's feeling. And then on the other side of the frame, you've got 100,000 screaming maniac fans. It was easily one of the most powerful, you know, moments, you know, in the film. Uh, but, you know, it's, we also forgot because of our connection with the band, just how big they are. You know, you forget after a while and seeing these people staying all day, you know, they were there for basically 12 hours to see their heroes. Uh, you forget the power, you know, that's, that's behind the throne in a way. And the name of the film is Metallica, Some Kind of Monster. It's a new documentary. And uh, we're talking tonight with the filmmakers. We have Joe Berlinger and we also have Bruce Sanofsky. What challenges went into making this film, Metallica, Some Kind of Monster? A lot of things uh, were challenges. Um... But really just riding this monster to its conclusion. I mean, really, this was a promo assignment. You know, initially, we lobbed in a call to Lars as we did once a year, you know, because Lars was so into the band's connection, the Paradise Lost, that we started talking about doing something together. And then once a year, we'd call and say, hey, is, is now the time? And, and really, we went out there on the record label's dollar, um, and they thought we were doing a promo video. They didn't quite realize how much therapy we were filming and how we were basically the challenge of morphing this in, into a feature film and convincing everybody that this was the right way to go was, was I think, the, one of the challenges. The other challenge was this is a film that had no obvious structure like a murder trial in Paradise Lost. And just, you know, shooting 1,600 hours of footage was just physically draining. Um, you had to stick with the story, and the story was psychological and emotional development, and that is a much harder kind of film to make than, you know, covering a murder trial for a month. Um, so just sticking with it and having faith that this would pay, pay off because, you know, there were a lot of naysayers along the way, and we were getting offers for other kinds of work, and particularly when James was away in rehab, we were like firemen ready to jump down the pole. We had to remain in this state of readiness, which allowed, which meant that we couldn't take other work because we were afraid that if we took a job and we weren't there for the moment James came back, which you see in the film, that it would have a detrimental effect on the project. But we would be offered like a commercial that would last a month. That is money we need. And we'd see the start date and the end date come and go. And still James was in rehab and we'd be like kicking ourselves. Well, man, that's 40 grand we could have made, you know, and that's hard. You know, it's hard on the families. And it's hard on, you know, to keep your spirit going. Um, and at one point, frankly, Electra, when they realized that actually we were sitting on a mountain of gold, uh, two thirds of the way into the process, wanted to take our footage and, and, metamorphosize our project into a reality TV show um, because they owned the footage. They wanted to make the next Ozzy Osbourne reality show because Ozzy had just had his first successful season. And on the one hand, if I was a record company executive sitting on a pile of gold in this era of um, declining record sales, I'd probably ask for the same thing. Um, and they had a right to it. And we were not, this was not an independent film. They owned the footage. They were paying us. And so, you know, it created quite a moment of, you know, our hearts sank when we heard that, and we sat down, we talked to the band, and the band decided that these moments are much too personal and precious to so overtly connect to the selling of albums. In fact, Electra wanted to, six weeks prior to the start date of the 
sorry, six weeks prior to the uh, release date of the album, they were going to start airing episodes with the final episode airing on the album's drop date. And James in particular said, we don't want to connect this, this period of our lives to the overt selling of albums. And so basically they told Elektra, look, we're, we're going to take this film over. They handed Elektra $2 million because that's how much had been spent to date and said, we believe in Joe and Bruce's vision. Take as long as you want, guys. Make the movie you want. So what was in the middle a very vexing and challenging problem ended up being an incredibly rewarding experience. Never in our lives have subjects treated us so well where they would give us final cut, pay for the movie, and tell their record label, which t- would be to their own detriment, to not promote the album as effectively as, as they could have. And the name of the film is Metallica, Some Kind of Monster. It's a new documentary, and uh, we're talking tonight with the filmmakers. We have Joe Berlinger, and we also have Bruce Sanofsky. One of the scenes that I liked uh, was uh, when Lars is selling his artwork. I think this, the sequence in the film demonstrates just how hard it was for him to part with that art because as he says you know a lot of guys would park money in the bank he'd park the money on his walls but he was very attached and into that mm-hmm. art art and um uh you know some people can be cynical and you know oh, let's cry for the rich rock star who's selling his art collection but it was incredibly brave of him considering his napster image and considering that these guys are you know want to be perceived as a working class band um to be so honest about kind of the social economic strata that he inhabits. And um, it's an incredibly revealing scene that everybody, again, to Lars's credit, when we showed the band a rough cut of the movie, you know, I think Bruce mentioned earlier, there's nothing in the film that we were asked to take out and nothing that the band asked us to put in. We were given total freedom. But all of the people in Lars's life pleaded with him to take that sequence out of the movie. Why, why is that? Just... They felt it was bad for his Napster image, and you know, his even his wife wanted the scene out. His managers, his bandmates at Lars, you should really rethink this scene. Well, I mean, how does it? What does it do to his Napster image? Well, I think it happens to humanize the guy and provide a, a rich and deep dimension, which is why we think it's a positive thing in the film and why we want it in the film. But if you want to be cynical about it, here's a guy who brought down Napster because people were downloading his music, depriving him of his twenty-five cent royalty. Per, you know, which is an incorrect argument as to why Lars wanted Napster to go. Lars wanted Napster to go because uh, he felt the artist should be in control of what happens to your music. They had been recording, um, you know, a song in the in the studio, uh, and it wasn't even finished, and it ended up on Napster and was being downloaded, and he felt that that was not the right thing to do. Um, but if you want to be cynical, here's a guy who's sell, auctioning off 13 million paintings, $13 million worth of paintings, and if you want to view Napster simply as a greedy rock star wanting to save every penny for himself, which is not the case. But if you want to view it that way, then this guy flaunting his wealth, you know, after having br- been very responsible for bringing down Napster, uh, you could say that it's a negative portrayal. We think the scene is very inspiring and shows Lars's depth as a person. Um, but the people around him were very concerned for him. And Lars said, look, if you're going to make a movie about Metallica, if you're going to go this personal route that Joe and Bruce keep advocating, uh, then to not show it would be, you know, not showing who I really, I really am. And uh, he, he wanted it in. You know, here Basquiat probably got paid a couple of hundred bucks or a couple of thousand dollars for the original version of that painting. Lars paid about 900000 for it which I guess is confidential, but I guess I've just revealed that. And then he sold it for $5 million, and he was particularly proud, not of the money, but of he's, he, was, he chose Christie's over the other auction houses because they believed as a mission they could get Basquiat to the next level. You know, of, of, that was the highest Basquiat had ever gotten at auction. And I suppose you could make the argument, you know, well, that's intellectual property that, that the original creator is not benefiting from the I price e- price escalations, and therefore it's sort of ironic that the guy who brought down Napster. But I don't look at it that way because, you know, like if Lars makes an album and signs it for some, and somebody buys it for $10 and he signs it and then that gets auctioned off for $500, I don't think Lars's claim is that he should have control over that. I th- he just doesn't think the original product of what he creates should be given away for free without his approval.